7.05 p.m. City of Summerton Regular Council meeting. Today we have a special guest from uh, Student of the Month from Tierra del Sol School. Can you please come? And they're going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the Council. Uh, Jose Yepes, 440 West Spring Street, and... <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Maribel Zavala from 248 East Geofield up the street. Um, on behalf of the Josefina Yepes Council Walk, we, we are here to personally invite you to our Council Walk. Uh, this year is going to be the 13th Council Walk, and uh, it all either starts or it ends here in Summerton, and we're very uh, proud and honored for uh, uh, the continued commitment uh, and support that the city has always given us. Uh, this year, fortunately, uh, we managed to help with the last year's cancer rush, about 35 people. Uh, unfortunately, every year there's more and more cases of cancer in our area, and uh, we're trying to make this event uh, bigger. Uh, but again, uh, on behalf of the cancer board, uh, Agustin Tumbaga, our, our vice president, Maribel Zavala, our treasurer, and Gina Yep as my wife as a secretary, we would like to invite you guys to uh, join us. It's a fun event. It's going to be uh, November 30th. Uh, it starts right at 8 o'clock here at the, the San Luis Walking Clinic, and it would go up to the Cocopa Casino and back again into Summerton. So, um, then? Yes, we, we are very honored, and thank you for for supporting our our walkathon 
for 13 years. And, uh, and I would like to see you guys there, if you could make it. Yes. And that's. Oh, thank you very much, and uh, great job. Thank you. Anybody else from the public wishing to address council? Okay, moving on to consent agenda, item number one. Minutes to the regular council meeting of October 1st, 2019. Meeting for regular council meeting of October 15th, 2019. Discussion? No. If it's under consent agenda, it's not discussion. Oh. So, approval and application for extension of premises, patio, requested by AFI 350 Bar and Grill LLC for November 29, 2019. Contract with American Pavement Preservation for slurry seal work. Anybody from uh, council wants to remove an item from consent agenda? Here, I just want to pull out item three uh, for discussion. Okay. <coughs> is, is there um, is a motion for that? It just removed and then approval for one, two, two, two and four. Yes. So is there a motion for uh, to approve item from number one, two, and four? So motion by Vice Mayor Garcia, second by Councilman Villafano. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We should kick. So item number three, discussion, Councilman Gonzalez. The reason I want to pull out item number three, yeah. <coughs> and the reason I'm, why I'm waiting you know, on this item is for the following. Uh, the event was posted on social media before bringing it to council. Uh, the council recently approved guidelines for requests for any kind of support in which the states are going to have it over here. It says uh, events must provide a demonstrated benefit to the community. To me, uh, if it would have been a, a fundraising event with a, with a, someone with a nonprofit organization, uh, I wouldn't really have an issue with it. Uh, when someone is requesting for extension of premises and city property, to me, that's an in kind. Uh, and this application doesn't benefit the city nor the community. And I just want to say for the record, if I get approved, then any city resident that fills out an application for extension of premises should not be denied. Any uh, comments or questions? I just wanted to make a comment. Um, being that it's here on Main Street, I think it does benefit the community. Um, these um, businesses, um, and I would have no no um, issues if you know Coffee Ten would want to because you know we're trying to help these businesses grow, so I wouldn't have an issue. And also, Councilman was out of the discussion when we discussed the, and I don't know if it's in, if it's been in, in writing, but that commercial businesses in downtown, being that we want to establish a entertainment corridor that. We would facilitate as uh, much as possible, and it would be any business, as the vice mayor said, that, um, that 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 we that we should support because that's been on our general plan and uh, economic development that we want to establish an entertainment uh, corridor. So this is part of the uh, the what we want to build here in downtown. But now someone yeah, but. And actually, the president has already been set with the Old de Oro. They had a tasty on Main Street. They did an extension of premises way, board, way before the 85350 even existed. So, I mean, it's something that we've already supported in the past. So, for me, I don't see a problem with it. Okay. I was just going to say, I, 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 I think as long as we have all the uh, liability insurance paperwork, uh, you know, um, uh, if, if there were something were to happen as long as we're not liable, uh, legal, if you can elaborate on that. Uh, yes, uh, uh, we did receive a certificate uh, uh, of liability uh, along with the name of the city as an insured in that certificate, so we're yeah, covered. So, so we're covered, I mean, I, I just uh, want to say. And, and like I said, I don't have any problem if it would have been a non-profit, like we had a Gabrito Halloween, uh, 
thing uh, last week or two weeks ago, and I was okay with it. You know, it was it was a nonprofit organization organizing that as, and uh, for 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 a good purpose. And like I said, we just approved the uh, the form and the request for in kind support, and it says events must provide a demonstrated benefit to the community. And, and uh, I do kind of agree with, with Councilwoman uh, Vice Mayor Garcia, but in reality, it's in the alley and it's city property, in not so much on Main Street. Um, so again, it's that's my only concern that, uh, like I say, if we can avoid on it, if it's gonna be a, a yes, then pretty much every city resident can apply for premises and we can deny them. Because, uh, I mean, Capitone or anybody else, even any other city uh, uh, resident can, can apply for this. Uh, like I say, we just uh, approved this so it could be black and white. And there's other things that are here that are, to me, it's a special event. So uh, permits should be filled out, permits for the uh, like an application. And again, it would have been for a nonprofit. I wouldn't have an issue with it, but. It was the item, you know, and, and I didn't read uh, the, um, you know, the, the latest rendition there, but is there an item there for uh, commercial? With, because it was discussed during that that for commercial on Main Street that that we would that there would be uh, some sort of exception uh, regarding the ink kind, and, and I don't know if it was written in there, but but it should have because it was discussed. During. Yes, it's in there. It's in there. And I actually, uh, Mayor uh, Mayor says in kind services. You know, what's the definition of in kind services? I mean, uh, this is an extension of premises, which is perfectly allowed by state statute. They didn't call it in-kind services. They called <coughs> it extension of a premises. So if we're going to be citing in-kind services, that's that's more like an employee's time and effort. It has nothing to do with, with, with property. So, I mean. And, and in addition, it was, the policy was, in order for it to be have staff know what the policy is, but it was very clear that if it diverted from that policy, that that they had to come to council. Like there was a walk here a couple weeks ago that re that requested in kind, and the condition was they need to come uh, uh, to council, and that's what this business is doing, coming to council. So the 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 policy was written to allow staff to make determination, but if there's a diversion from it, this is the process. Come to council in a public setting and it can be discussed, so that. Like I said, <coughs> to me, when someone is requesting for additional premises on city property, that's an impact. Yeah, but the process is come towards council to request it, and that's why this, no, I, this, this item is. I don't have an issue with that, with the uh, with the uh, person who person the, the and nobody's saying we're we're talking yeah. about in general. You're saying that we're setting a precedent, and the precedent is if you're requesting services, come in a public setting, and we'll discuss it, and that's what's being done. But we're trying to follow that the new the new uh, thing that we approve, you know. And Any other comments, questions? But again, that's. Motion by Vice Mayor Garcia. Second. Second by Council Media Pando. All those in favor? Aye. So it's uh, five. Yes, yeah. Okay, moving on to new business. Consideration and possible approval of a full commission establishing November 2019 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the city of San Mateo. This, you know, there was an unfortunate event that happened here, you know, last month, in which you know, the, this proclamation hits those two home here in our community. So, Mr. McGee. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. As the mayor mentioned, domestic violence is a nationally recognized public health issue and causes serious health related consequences, according to the Centers for De Disease Control. One in four women and one in nine men in the United States experience domestic violence and report negative impacts such as injury, 
fear, concern for safety, and more. This proclamation aims to build awareness to help prevent domestic violence in our community and elsewhere. Is there a motion to approve proclamation? So motion by Vice Mayor Garcia, second by Councilman Galindo. All those in favor? Aye. Any votes? Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, if I might, we're honored to have with us two dignitaries to accept copies of this proclamation. <coughs> we have with us Diane Humphreys, Executive Director of Amberley's Place, and we have Susanna Zambrano from the organization Proverbs 31 Home. So please, if you wish, feel free to step forward. I'm gonna read it and then... Oh, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Domestic Violence Awareness Month, November 2019. Whereas families are the fabric of a community and should foster safety, security, and love. And whereas domestic violence destroys families and weakens communities. And whereas domestic violence is a willful <coughs> intimidation, assault, or other abusive behavior perpetrated by one intimate partner against another and includes physical violence, threats, and emotional abuse. And whereas domestic violence can affect men, women, and children in every community regardless of age socioeconomic status, race, or geographical location, and whereas the effects of domestic violence are long-lasting and harmful to not only individuals and families, but communities as a whole, and whereas domestic violence is one of the most dangerous and expensive crimes in the criminal justice system, and whereas more can be done to prevent domestic violence. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Gerardo Naya, Mayor of the City of Somerton, do hereby proclaim the month of November 2019 has Domestic Violence Awareness Month in summer. Number two, presentation of awards to PEP Youth Build Program in recognition of Cultural Center Project. Uh, I want to thank uh, PEP Youth Build Program uh, for all their uh, support. And, uh, and uh, I have here uh, Parks and Recreation Director Jesus Mesa with an award. Good evening. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Members of Council, this is my Person Creation Director. I'm here tonight uh, to commend the work of PPET program being led by their leader, Jesse Lopez, and their uh, supervisor, Manuel Campa, on the excellent duty and work to this community. They provided a great service uh, last month, finishing uh, a project at our, uh, our cultural center, and it's a kickoff to our revitalization project of this facility. It's very helpful and it's gonna be part of a process that is gonna help highlight our cultural programming and in our community and facilities. So I'm here on behalf, gonna present all the people that were involved in this project and recognize each and every one and hopefully get a, a picture with council. First, it's gonna be Andres Nunez. Set Cimental, can you please, um, Andres, can you please uh, line up here in front, Andres? Can you please stay here in front? Dana Estrada. Gracias. 
Francisco Lemus. Wistor Villegas. Josué Velázquez. Karen Vázquez. Luis Solorio. Ricardo Gardea Junior. Yesenia Linares. Andrea, Andrei Cárdenas, disculpe. Enrique Morales. Georgina Melero. Huelahuetza Quintero. Gustavo Laurel. Héctor Morales. Jesús Cota. Milenia Alcantar. Alcantar. Yomaira Márquez. And their supervisor, which led the, the activity and supervised. Uh, he's very helpful and a very good attitude. Manuel Campa. So, I don't know if council wants to see a picture here in front of. In front, yeah, in front would be nice, because, yeah, in front. Also, their leader, yeah, address a few words, Jesse Lopez. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and all the council members, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to participate in the city of Somerton. And um, uh, 
this is uh, all the PEPA Juvenile Maricopa uh, program. And uh, they will have the graduation on November the 21st uh, this year. So I'd like to, to everybody to invite you to attend the ceremony. So I will give it to you the invitation and I will send by email also the confirmation. Thank you very much again for uh, the opportunity to give us uh, to participate in the city of Somerton. And uh, I know <laughs> Jesus Mesa uh, and, um, and uh, we have a uh, projects in the future for the next uh, cycle that will be in, uh, starting on, on the month of March of the next year. So uh, we put in contact with uh, Mr. Mesa to uh, make a, a schedule to work more on the city of San Luis. Thank you again. Summer to summer. Summer to summer. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've been around and I just can't believe, you know, I'm not saying you're old, but you still have the energy to work with, that, with these young kids. So, you know, on my behalf, I'd like to thank you for continuing being sure. a part of this. Sure, thank you. With, um, I have the opportunity to start this program on the 2003 here in Somerton. So I worked very hard to put everybody in the community. So right now we have recognition on the national level. And um, we have a recognition for uh, a sixth time winning the LULAC uh, state uh, recognition for community service. So we are very, you know, impact the, the community. So. But uh, the city of Somerton, for me, is the city that opened the doors for this program. So I very appreciate your uh, uh, support. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Council Members, Zarina Gallegos, Finance Director. How are you? Okay. Give me just a second while I pull up the... Uh, okay. So I will... I'm sorry? Control what? No. All right. Can I zoom? Okay, that's why it was gonna keep it this way. Good evening. So I have prepared this um, quarterly um, financial with some uh, numbers, some raw numbers, because these numbers are not finalized, they're not audited, and so I just wanna make sure that you're aware of that there may be variances within these numbers. Um, and I wanted to put it in the same format as you've seen in, in the past when we prepare the budget so that um, you find some consistency between the reports. I will go ahead and email this to you all so you can uh, review it a, a bit further. And um, I've, I've indicated the budget. I'll start off with general fund and with regards to general fund, the first column you'll find is our budget, the approved budget for fiscal year 2020. I have a, the, the next column is the budget, um, uh, the quarter, the budget in, in, I'm sorry, the budget allocated based on the first quarter and the first quarter actual, the first quarter actual numbers followed by the percentages as the, uh, as they appear relevant to the particular revenues. So as you can see right now for the general fund, overall we have uh, received about almost 70% of the revenues that we budgeted in 2020 for the first quarter. 
you'll find that there are some um, there are some numbers that are a bit off. For instance, the intergovernmental revenues they appear a little um, they appear they appear a little shy just because with for example at the end of September we don't receive those revenues until October towards the middle end of October so these won't appear as recorded um, ex uh, revenues within this um, within this report the same goes for fire services um, we usually don't uh, bill uh, for fire until the following month and so we have to um, accommodate for that so in the next quarter you'll probably you'll see that those numbers are more consistent with the um, the percentages as we move we move down and feel free to interrupt me should you have any questions as I go over the numbers um, with regards to our um, expenditures in operations and personnel our pers uh, we are a little below the quarter in percentages we're about 87 percent in personnel and 81 percent in operating overall we are about uh, 85 however when you take into account our capital outlay our debt service and our contingency we end up at about 67 percent of the actual spent budget and this is this is this you'll see consistently every first quarter because usually for at least debt purposes or capital outlay those expenditures don't happen until either January 1st or towards the end of the fiscal year so we'll always have a little bit our numbers are going to be a little skewed as a result and I've identified the expenditures by um, by department so you can see mayor councils administration and the reason you'll see that the numbers are a little higher at least the percentages for example in administration is because those um, those personnel numbers have to be manually adjusted as they don't automatically flow from our ADP system into Cassell so we have to go back and actually make adjustments to several line items for example health insurance um, workers compensation and retirement to allocate those properly so those haven't been that hasn't been done yet so that's why you'll see the the percentages a little high for personnel however overall uh, with regards to the general fund we are tracking at about 80 percent So a good example is finance. You see that, I'm, that the percentage is about 107% for personnel. That's a result of those adjustments that have to be done after the fact to, to make sure that all those additional benefits are being allocated properly, for example, from the general fund to our enterprise funds, our water, sewer, and sanitation funds. You'll also find that in the next in the next quarter, um, we will have the city attorney department as well as part of our our overall budgets. So as you can see, the surplus deficit um, right now we are about fifty one thousand in the in a deficit as a result of those lagging revenues because this is on a cash basis versus accrual. And we have our HER fund. We did, we did receive notification from, um, from the state that we would get additional funds from HERF. So that's why you see that um, additional 120% um, overall HERF is A little um, on the lower side as a result of the CIPs that haven't fully been expended and uh, as a result of debt service
for water, we're tracking um, well, um, a little over and on the revenue side and on the expenditures because not all the projects and again the debt service hasn't been expended for the current uh, for the current quarter. You'll find that in expenditures, it's it, it the percentage is a bit low. So you'll see about 35 percent. And wastewater so I presented the the major funds that um, represent the majority of our revenues and expenditures so if you have any questions for me Anything of note, any highlights that we should pay attention to um, outside of the skew uh, that that um, the skews from the accrual to the cash because this is this is more of a cash what we've received in not what we've actually what we'll actually be billing out so for example for fire um the cocoa pot uh, for what we bill for the services that we provide you'll find that will be in october because once our expenditures come in from july through september then in october they receive the bill so you'll find that um th that uh, you'll see that those revenues are come in and they're they're actually reflected to the full extent i think it, it's a, a more of a matter of timing specifically for our debt that skew our numbers a little more um i can definitely put together some pie charts and some some graphs for next presentation i thought i would go ahead and uh, present this to you as is because this is how you'll see the budget presentations very soon <laughs> once we start preparing the budget, but I will um, go ahead in the future, include a couple of, uh, of uh, charts and graphs for you. Perhaps that'll make it a little um, uh, better visually. Thank you. You're welcome. Item number five, discussion of possible approval of a plan to address compensation for pressure affecting some positions in the state service. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, at the October 15th, 2019 council meeting, human resource specialist Armando Leon outlined a method to preliminarily address compensation compression. As you know, compression happens when you have small differences in pay regardless of experience, skills, level, or seniority. This can occur when an organization's internal compensation structure is outdated and can also be triggered by wage increases affecting the bottom end of the compensation range, but not the top. Mr. Leon is here to present his plan at this time. Good evening, Mayor Anaya, Vice Mayor Garcia, Council Members. What you're receiving at the moment from Ms. Uh, Venezuela is the um, an example that I used um, the last time that we met, uh, where we, I basically discussed what the, the conceptually, how the, um, what the approach would be to deal with the uh, compression. So in this particular example, we have a maintenance worker, one in parks and recreation, and we looked at, uh, if you look at the top three um, rates of pay at 1222, and then to the right, that's the, um, that's the years of service. So the top one has 0.57 years of service, next one 0.11, the next one 3.74, so almost four years of service, yet the rates of pay are exactly the same. So when we're talking about compression, that's an example of what compression looks like. Um, so that's what we were um, attempting to address, and conceptually, um, we agreed on the plan last time, and so now I have uh, my results.
Okay, so I did look at all, all the positions uh, for the city of Somerton and basically look at, looked at the uh, job uh, classifications as groups and then compared uh, what entry-level employees uh, rates look like compared to some of the more tenured employees. So compression, uh, we ended up, I ended up analyzing 55 positions, L looked at all the positions, but 55 positions were more closely analyzed that were impacted by compression. And so the first department that uh, we're looking at is the police department. Uh, so what I did is I looked at uh, <coughs> look in uh, in our discussion last time we were um, looking at what would be a method of analyzing and dealing with compression in the absence of having a formal compensation study. So the last time that we've had uh, our compensation study or our um, job grades um, looked at or classified has been in 2007. So our job classifications are very outdated. And so the next method was to look at what increases we've done recently. So I looked at the COLA increases over the last five years because that's real numbers and, uh, and a real method that we used here for the city of Somerton. Uh, in 2014, in July, we um, approved a COLA increase of 1.5%. In December 2015, uh, it was 2.0%. And then in July 2017, 1.5%. So what happened is that uh, as the minimum wage kept increasing, it kept uh, compressing the, the rates of pay between employees. So that's why we had that example of the uh, employees that were less than a year making exactly the same as somebody that was, was here about four years. So that was the concept that I used um, to, um, to determine where we had compression and where we needed to increase the rates of pay for some employees. Um, so uh, we have, um, when I looked at added the COLA increases back into the rates, um, I compared that rate with the current rates of pay. If it was greater than, then I, I took the greater number. And in some cases, for employees that have been here longer, maybe like eight, nine years, um, that wasn't enough. They were still at a, at, a, at, a, at a low rate. So in order to alleviate that, um, I gave more tenured employees a 1.5% increase so that we had some separation from the employees that were impacted up and then, but not increasing the higher end employees in, that, in the job classification. So these are the results. Uh, so the first department is the police department. Um, the proposed rate is in the yellow um, highlighted. The, I've also factored in the, um, the employment tax, such as Social Security, Medicare. I factored that in to get the total amount, as well as workers' comp and the retirement. So to the far right, that column, individually, that would be the impact annually for those, for those employees. includes all their EREs, all their benefits to that far right column. That, that's correct. That is correct. The next page um, are the firefighters. In the fire department, I looked at the firefighter EMT as one group and the firefighter paramedic as a separate group and analyzed those two groups uh, independently. And um, if you see to the right uh, where the proposed rate with color market adjustment or a 1.5% a increase, um, it was either keeping the current rate or um, that rate of pay that's in, in that column uh, was based on the COLA increases. And if that wasn't enough, then it was a 1.5% increase and it's listed on there. Then the next column to the right, again, those are the proposed new rates for these employees. And again, carry that all the way to the right column. Uh, we have the totals. That's the total annual impact um, annualized for each for each of these employees. The next page is the maintenance workers, and the maintenance workers because they're in two different departments, but they're in, in the same job classification. Um, I I grouped them together, so I, I I took Parks and Rec as well as Street Department um, into one group and analyze them as, as a unit. Um, and these are the results.
The next group after that is the uh, treatment plan operators. There are only two individuals in that group, um, but there was uh, a bit of a compression, so we took care of that as well. So the total impact uh, for these positions is uh, annualized at 12,570. So the compression um, under this method wasn't quite uh, as widespread as we initially suspected. Um, so we took care of the alleviator, at least a more, more, uh, more severe forms of compression. So that this takes care of that. Um, obviously there's more work to be done um, <coughs> as far as our uh, compensation structure. We do need to look at um, our salary scales, develop uh, some salary scales, um, and, and hopefully I'll be presenting an, a plan within the next, maybe before the next uh, fiscal cycle comes around. In the absence of having a formal compensation study done, then we'd need to do something internally to try to alleviate that. Any questions on that? Um, thank you. That was a lot just to figure out a formula that would work. That was equitable and that, that tied into something that we've already done. So it, it, I didn't want to just arbitrarily pick a plan, um, it, ha it had to tie it to something, and that, this was the best way to tie it into our current um, compensation um, structure. And, and, and one of the things during uh, the budget was that the you know, council wanted to alleviate this, and we thought it would be more of an impact, uh, and, 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 and it's not. And so there's still the uh, cost of living adjustment that was uh, proposed that, that, that money still there so and this study doesn't really tap into that correct because the the, the what we were um, tasked was to first look at the compression deal with that first and then uh, once we alleviated the compression um, then from that point forward then with the money's left over then it's, it goes back to you to decide what steps you want us to take um, moving forward with the rest of the money that was um, allocated. What was the proposed uh, cost of living? Uh, it, it, it was 25000 The it was, it was more, right? For COLA, for right. For COLA was... Yeah, the, the 25000 was the original. Yeah, yeah, the compression. For compression. For uh, it compression. Was 2 COLA, roughly $92,000 financial impact. And it's still there, right? Yes, it's in contingency. And, and, and that was a discussion at that time. If, uh, first, let's look at compression, and then if, uh, if we could give the COLA, then then, then, then we should. And I, at least uh, for me, I feel that, that that we should honor that. And whatever, whatever was proposed, that we give that COLA, and it would. And uh, I know there's some ideas floating around for what the. Uh, the remaining balance for the uh, for this compensation study, but that probably needs to be brought up in the future. You know, uh, then I'll open up for a discussion with the comments from the city council. Yes, ma'am. Just um, want to agree with what you said. Um, now that we kind of addressed the compression issue, um, you know, we can go about doing this and. and moving forward with the, with the cost of living adjustment um, and keep that remaining balance um, as a, you know, keep it in there for, for employee use, but like you said, bring it up later um, to see what we can do. If I may, um, Mayor and I, uh, there's um, uh, in the coming months um, or by next budget cycle, probably the next thing that we should look at, um, try to tackle is uh, some of the um, job classifications that have fallen um, behind the market. 
um, as the market has continued to uh, around us, Yuma, San Luis, um, they're increasing the rates and uh, in some areas we have fallen behind. So um, I think part of what we need to be looking at in the future is looking at what's going to be our uh, compensation philosophy. Do we continue to lag behind? Uh, certainly we're not going to be the leader uh, that Yuma's going to be taking the lead. Uh, we're not going to be the leader um, but uh, we also probably shouldn't fall too far behind, so we shouldn't lag. And, uh, and so the next option is to match. Uh, do we match? Um, maybe and that's probably a discussion, a discussion for, the for the future. That's At correct. This point, we we're discussing what we're going to do with the, correct. With the amount that's still remaining correct. for the call. Mm -hmm. So, any other questions, comments? You already said that this will be for another discussion, but I was reading here, Parks and Rec, um, maintenance work number one gets 422, and then I'm, I'm in the middle of fill out, I was, and I'm looking here as a, can you explain what's EFF firefighter? Stands for just a regular. Those are uh, firefighter EMTs, and, and that's a classification that's designated in ADP in our payroll system. So that's some job codes are kind of hard coded in there. Yeah. It's hard for me to understand. They're making 1224 two cents more than. <coughs> Parks and Rec, no, I'm not going against Parks and Rec, but it's, you know, I think we're lacking, and like you said, it's a discussion for later. Yes, yeah, and, and I think, like uh, Armando said, we'll, we'll look at what the other cities are, and, mm -hmm. and with the data in front of us, and then we'll make decisions, but at least, you know, thinking, you know, there's different methods, you know, there's more overtime, too, so that's probably something that we need to look at at all of the departments and, and make a determination instead of just doing on one. But at least now, the question is, what are we going to give the COLA or the direction? And, and, and we have excess funds that are remaining for that, for, uh, for, from this uh, compens uh, compression. So, you know, and, and so the, the vice mayor and myself, we, uh, we would like to give the COLA, of course, retroactive to Whenever it you know, it was, because of the, the funding was not tapped into, it. and you know, and I know there's some ideas floating around, but at least at this point we're not. At least uh, I'm not ready to decide what to do with the extra compression for the twelve, thirteen thousand. That maybe there's a plan that that's in place. That's gonna be fun. Mayor, I'm ready, ready to proceed with the cost of living increase. My only question is, is what, what happens to, are we going to give a, give it across the board even to new hires that have recently joined us? You know, for me, I think it's, it's fair to do the six months, six months minimum employment with the city. For sure, we should have a policy on the cost of living, and usually new employees don't get it, right? Or <coughs> probation or something like that? Not sure, but uh, we're not aware of any policy addressing the length of service before okay. receiving the COLA. I'm not aware of it either, to be honest with you. I was just going to say that if, uh, if 25,000 were allocated for the uh, compression and we're just going to use half of that, the other half would agree with all the other councilmen, the founder, and the vice mayor, and the mayor that uh, we should allocate the other to the COLA. But again, addressing the issue with the six month uh, that comes from the Yeah, the, well, the, the uh, excess on the compression was to be analyzed and see what yeah. they're, they're trying to do, but the COLA is there, it, it, we didn't touch the COLA. Yeah. So it's about 90 some thousand that. Oh, mm -hmm. so, so I think we do need to analyze, man, we do need to analyze what to do with that extra funding the uh, compression. I feel that at this point in time, we could proceed with a cola. But again, you know, my, my preference is to do a 
minimum employment was like six months. I mean, they're, they're the ones that have been struggling us, with us for, for years. Clarification with the six month, would that mean six if it's retroactive? So six months that it would have had to start, say, what, January 1st? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bill. thanks. This, uh, on this item, we're not going to take any action, so it's just a presentation from from the Sunset Community on the proposal. <laughs> and City Council, we can, uh, we have questions, but let's not get too detailed until we, we discuss the proposal. But if you need clarification or anything, please go ahead. I don't want to get too detailed uh, discussion. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, we had the proposal for Sunset Community Health Centers. That was based on the RFP uh, that we published back in August this of this year, 2019. As you recall, the, uh, the city, back in 2017, the city purchased a 55-acre parcel. That's the area just next to the, uh, the, Somerton, the, the future Somerton High School so the city uh, purchased 55 acres. Um, out of those 55 acres, uh, uh, the original park is going to take uh, 30 plus acres. And it was directed, uh, council directed city staff to, uh, to look at the, uh, the options of uh, about 15 acres to use it for commercial development. So the RFP, like as I mentioned, it was published uh, on the Human Daily Sun back in August 7, 14, 21. 21st and uh, 28th. Um, so after the publish was completed, uh, we received uh, one proposal, um, which was uh, Sunset Community Health Center. And um, as you may know, so we still some other couple other projects pending that we expected uh, some middles. On the map to the right of the screen, you see the uh, this area here, that's the high school site. And in this area here, that's the 55 acres that the city owns. But the 15 acres, the 15 acres that we're talking about for this discussion is the area that's outlined in black, the 15 acres. Uh, it's about in the middle of the uh, Pericone Park. You go west all the way to the property line to the, to the west, and then and also the uh, runaway of the uh, main street. As you recall, so we, we had a redevelopment plan that was approved back a uh, few years ago. The area that, the, uh, that we're talking about today is also part of the redevelopment plan. So anything that we, that we do uh, on this log area uh, around the uh, 50, 15 acres, even also the uh, 15 acres, will be part to try to meet the goals of the, of the redevelopment plan to bring development in that area. So now the proposal uh, from Sunset, they, uh, based on the proposal, what they're asking is a five acres, five acre site. And uh, the proposal includes uh, 500,000 per acre, uh, with total of 500,000. And the building is about two stories building, uh, about 20,000 square feet. And the, based on the discussion, the, on the nar narrative of the uh, proposal, right now they have uh, 40 employees in the existing location, and they, they, uh, they're planning to add 20 more, and maybe more in the future. Uh, I mean, the use is gonna continue the same, but uh, it's gonna add new services. And the total investment, according to the proposal uh, inf information, the investment is about $7.5 million uh, construction on that site. And below is an example, I mean, it's, that's the conceptual elevation 
as part of the submittal to a storage building. This is the uh, preliminary layout <coughs> of the uh, of the, fi the 15 acres. And the, the site plan that they're proposing, uh, that it will be facing uh, facing Main Street. And they also, they recommend, I mean, they're proposing to add a commercial, uh, a commercial um, development in this area. The layout is only preliminary. Um, Based on my experience, I would recommend something else, but um, but the intent of this proposal is to add uh, a commercial venue as part of their, their overall package, as part of their proposal. As you can see, this line over here on the uh, on the right side of the screen, that's the, the area in the middle between Cesar Chavez and to the middle of the city property the alignment that will join the high school to the north. So this preliminary uh, access uh, could be changed based on other needs because we're looking into, and our companies are looking into another sites over here. So it will depend how, how we design it, uh, a subdivision plan. But for now, the intent is only to show the location. So based on uh, analysis that, that I have done, the, the, uh, this proposal, the benefits, we start development on the west side of the, pro of the city. As you know, we're trying to incentivize uh, development on the west side, especially around the city property. And I believe this, uh, this uh, proposal will, will start that. In addition, uh, by bringing this kind of development, will also uh, assist with the uh, infrastructure that we eventually, eventually we're gonna need it for the, uh, uh, for the high school and the other commercial developments. Uh, it, they may be able to share the cost of the infrastructure extension. We had the, the water across the street, south of Main Street, but the sewer, the sewer is, uh, is right there on the uh, north side of Main Street. Um, in addition, uh, the proposal will add new jobs and, and uh, many visitors to the area, uh, nurses, doctors, or patients, that so eventually it's gonna create an economic impact around that site, in, even in, inside the, uh, the location of their facility. Um, in the future, this may also um, involve a new residents coming to the area employees of the facility. Now that we have, if we have this facility on the west side, we have a lot of residential uh, already sown properties around the high school. So this also can be an opportunity for new residents in the future. So I mentioned economic activity, um, uh, restaurants or retail, maybe uh, bringing, uh, coming into this area by knowing that we have employees and and people coming into the location. Um, the, the high school, um, based on the information that provided in, in, within the proposal, they also mentioned that they, will, they may have uh, some activities for the high school, inviting some of the uh, students to be involved as uh, internships, uh, if, they, if they would like to get involved in the medical field. So they may also be communicating with the high school um, administration to, to have a to have uh, some kind of a uh, relationship with a high school. Uh, this is an example of their, as part of the proposal, the layout of their, their, their floor plans, the first story and the second, the second story. Um, that's the slides that I have, but before I, I go to the recommendation, I would like to uh, have some information that they will provide to you as part of the impact, only for information. Yeah, we don't need a recommendation, I'm just yeah. the proposal. Yes, the so we we'll start with this slide.
Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, and members of the council, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you about this uh, potential project that, uh, well, the RFP that we submitted to the city. Uh, for those of you, uh, let me first start by, uh, I'm, my name's David Rogers, I'm the CEO of Sunset. Uh, I have been the CEO here uh, in the community for 16 years now. Uh, as many of you know, we have uh, gone through extensive growth uh, over the last 15 years or so. Uh, no matter what metric you look at, the organization is three, uh, better than three times what it was 15 years ago. And uh, the reason I want to point that out is because I want to assure the, you know, the council that the uh, Sunset uh, Health is very strong financially. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the adequate, uh, you know, support staff and the professional staff in order to both plan uh, and implement a project of this nature. Uh, we look forward to an opportunity to add additional services and to expand services. Uh, we've been somewhat landlocked, as many of you know, where we're currently located. Uh, we, some 12 years ago, we went through a major renovation. We were able to increase the uh, usable space at that time. And then we've been through some, uh, you know, minor modification over the last five or six years, but nothing that allows us to add uh, additional uh, internal medicine providers or other adult medicine providers or an additional pediatrician. We also have interest in adding behavioral health, uh, a behavioral health integrated component here in the, uh, our Summerton Clinic. And then uh, we know that we desperately need to create additional space so that we can add uh, additional dental operatories and provide more dental services. Uh, in the current clinic, we only have three dental operatories. Uh, we really need uh, six to eight operatories in or order to bring on, you know, an additional uh, dentist as well as a hygienist. And so we're somewhat limited in our ability uh, to provide the, you know, what is a satisfactory level of services to our board of directors uh, and to our organization. Uh, you know, Sunset uh, considers Summerton its home clinic. Everything for Sunset began here in Summerton back in 1975. Uh, began with the migrant health grant that operated out of a trailer just uh, to the uh, north of where we're standing here today. And uh, so it has evolved to a multi-clinic system. Uh, we've had uh, the opportunity to grow and expand and add staff. This particular project would add uh, about 20 additional staff people, uh, would be a couple of providers, a dentist, uh, a pharmacist, and then all of the support personnel uh, that would be required in order to support these providers in the delivery of either medicine, uh, dentistry, and or behavioral health care. Uh, we hope to basically double our presence in uh, the city of Summerton. Uh, the numbers that you're looking at uh, suggest that we currently have, uh, you know, about 6,000 uh, active patients or active users of the Sunset Health uh, Clinic here in Summerton. We would bring an additional somewhere between five and uh, five thousand and fifty five hundred additional uh, you know patients or we would have capacity for that and then we would increase our annual patient encounters from about twelve thousand a year uh, to approximately somewhere between seventeen and thousand and seventeen thousand five hundred uh, all of this would equate to a, you know, a, an additional ability to infuse from an economic standpoint, additional uh, you know, monetary benefit for the community. Uh, it would be stable employment for uh, you know, those individuals that we would hire here. It would also provide us adequate space so that we could uh, do more teaching, uh, bring, rotate more residents and other students of either nurse practitioner or physician assistant programs. Uh, through our, our clinics. That's been one of the drawbacks and why we have not been able to do that here in Summerton. We just don't have adequate space uh, to accommodate a teaching environment. And so the majority of that up to this point, unfortunately, has occurred in, in, in Yuma where we have a little more uh, space. So this project would solve many of those problems. And uh, we certainly look forward to working, you know, with the city of Summerton and the staff here uh, at the city of Summerton. Uh, you know, as you've seen from the proposal, you know, we uh, 
we submitted our RFP with uh, the asking price of 100,000 per acre, and then we're willing, uh, you know, to pay, uh, you know, our fair share of the cost uh, in order to provide the infrastructure to develop that particular area. We certainly would like to be, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in the initial phase of the economic uh, development that occurs in that area. Uh, we want to work closely with the high school once it is up and running. We want to do a better job of, uh, you know, working with students to get them interested and prepare them for careers in medicine uh, and or dental and or behavioral health care. So I think the uh, opportunities are endless with a project of this nature and we're, uh, we're very excited uh, about the possibility and we would really welcome the approval of the purchase of this acreage so we could move forward with uh, the project. We have, uh, you know, several of our board members here tonight who are, you know, here to answer any preliminary questions you have. We know that you don't want to go into detail. Uh, that, as Hector pointed out, is really not uh, the purpose of the presentation. It's just to give you an idea, idea of the concept and what's, uh, you know, kind of our, you know, part of our thinking and our desire, and that's truly just to improve our, pre improve our presence here in Somerton, to work closely, more closely with the agencies here in Somerton, and to provide additional jobs and additional uh, economic stimulus uh, for, for the economic development that's planned for the future. Thank you. Mayor, if you could give me a couple of minutes, I'll make it brief. Uh, I'm not here to present any numbers. Uh, I'm going to do a historical, real quick historical um, presentation. Uh, for those of you who might be concerned, because I'm a city employee and also a member of the, uh, the board, I did speak to uh, my boss, if you will, uh, our uh, presiding judge, explained to him the situation he found. Uh, absolutely no reason why I could not speak on behalf of Sunset since I'm not here specifically to ask for money, etc. He's a, a board member of a couple of nonprofits in Yuma himself. That aside, uh, real quick, I, I came on board uh, about 18 years ago, 17, 18 years ago. I've been a board member for Sunset. When I came on board, it was a risky situation. The community health center was um, basically bankrupt. We were literally, when we brought Dave in, if you remember, we were literally, uh, you know, facing hardship and, and making payroll uh, on a biweekly basis. I mean, we were left with a couple of thousand dollars in the, in the bank. So I, when we came on board, the new board members, we didn't come on board because everything was good. We came on board because everything was bad and we were trying to, to try to fix it. Why did I take an interest? Because I knew that Somerton um, was, if we will, the headquarters for that. Um, I wish um, Martin Porches, supervisor, had been here today because he's a witness to the story. When we, when we remodeled the present building where we're at uh, about, I don't know, 12 years ago, David, uh, we did a little ribbon cutting. And so he spoke at the ribbon cutting and I spoke. And, and after we did that, I, well, we both agreed that our parents, we would call the clinic the the hospital. We had a clinic. It was the hospital for most of our parents, most of our siblings, etc. But one of the things he did after the, the ceremony, he took me aside and says, "Okay, Judge, uh, we're going to get this remodeling. But when are we going to get a new clinic in Somerton? When are we going to get a, a, a spanking new clinic, modern, etc.?" And at that time, I said, "Oh, give us some time. We don't we don't have the funds. We don't have uh, the facilities, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. We ended up building a brand new facility in Somerton on 20, in Yuma on 24th. Then we built, uh, we added the, the Wilson Clinic, then we built another one on Avenue B. We built one in San Luis, we built another one on Avenue B. And believe it or not, I've been taking, not just myself, but David and other board members, we take some heat from Somerton residents saying, okay, everybody's getting a, a new clinic. The base for the clinic is Somerton and we haven't seen anything. About a month ago, I went to the, one of the new clinics on Avenue B as a patient. I was there waiting, and three Somerton residents, two senior citizens and one younger young lady, approached me and said, this is a beautiful building, uh, Judge. Uh, we like it. We like coming over here. But when are we going to get one in Somerton? So the point that I'm trying to make is that it's overdue for Somerton to have a new clinic, way overdue. Uh, 
it's impossible to remodel and continue remodeling the present building that we're in. Why? Because there's no room to, to, uh, to expand. We can go up, but that would take basically tearing down the building and starting over. I wanted to touch a couple other points. Um, it says 17.8 or 17.5, I mean 7.5. Actually, it's up to over about a little over 8 million, right? 8.3 now. So that would be uh, what the clinic would invest in terms of the building, about 8.2, 8.3 million. Uh, the area where we want to build the clinic is an area that was zoned by, by city for commercial purposes. But I feel that in order to get businesses such as a McDonald's or a Starbucks, or et cetera, they, they look at numbers that are stable. They look at numbers where you have a high school, you have, a, in this case, a clinic, you have other facilities that have stable individuals who are on a daily basis buy their breakfast, their coffee, their lunch, their, even their dinners, and not a fluctuating uh, a population. They, they, that's what they look at. They look at stable numbers that are gonna be there forever. They know the clinic's going to be there forever. The high school is going to be there forever. So that's one. So I think it's a, in a way of a, actually attracting uh, those type of businesses. Uh, number two, that I think it's important for the city to consider. Once, if it is approved uh, and we move, then that area where we're at now is free. Uh, we've talked to Hector a couple of times about it already. That's free. Uh, meaning, it meets exactly what you want to do is create more commercial business tax revenue generating businesses right in the middle of smack of, of summertime so that that lot if you will that facility will be up for sale and hopefully uh hector and uh david could get together and, and find a tenant uh for for that building say sell it or lease it etc uh which would be perfect we are emphasizing working with the high school. I am, that's one thing I'm gonna push with the new clinic, that we work closely with the high school so we can create um, on the job training, some kind of fellowships with the high school, uh, not just for, for medical, because not all of us can become judges and doctors and attorneys. Some people just wanna become RNs and whatever other <laughs> initials they have. And that's the type of position that I'm looking at, making sure that it's available for, for individuals who can't afford to go on to medical school. At least they have some kind of training for, for in the medical field. Uh, and last but not least, um, I think you would be, as a council, would be giving your constituents a beautiful spanking new clinic, something that can be proud of, like this particular building is. We went out of our way to look for individuals, architects that will, who came down, they looked at this building, at this particular facility, they took pictures, they went out and looked at the property that we're proposing to buy, and they're gonna continue on with this kind of architecture over there. So um, we thank you for your time. Uh, if you have any questions, you can contact David, uh, and he will give you the numbers. Thank you. Mayor, have any questions for me or? specifically be designated uh, by the SFB for the Summerton High School. The funds will go to the district and then it's up to the district to allocate those funds as they see fit best. Uh, our discussion regarding the IGA continues and of course the Parks and Rec Master Plan which you just discussed during the work session uh, will play a role in how the site is developed. We are seeking a meeting with the Summerton Postmaster to address concerns related to the census as well as issues expressed by residents 
concerning online shopping issues, um, not so much by uh, the post office, but by various parcel carriers. Uh, it turns out that many residents' addresses are showing up on online retail sites as not deliverable. Um, so that's not only a quality of life issue for our residents, but there's also potential sales tax implications when those things happen. So I want to try to drill that down and get to the bottom of that. Just a reminder that Dr. Core of Arizona Western College is hosting a community conversation about the work of Arizona Western College at the Somerton City Hall classroom on Friday, November 15th from 3 to 4 p.m. And we are expediting the repair of the windows here at City Hall and are expecting everything to be back in place by then. And I just wanted to briefly recognize the work of our police department, our IT help desk guy, Max, uh, Parks and Facilities Supervisor, Rodney, and other City Hall staff that uh, assist in the effort leading to the capture of the vandal who damaged City Hall and other properties on Sunday night. So, and I think I can speak for all of us uh, that we're very happy that the person was apprehended so quickly and will be facing justice. With that, I'll pass it over to, how about Ms. Gallegos? <coughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council Members. Um, uh, currently, I'm working on um, working on the financial statements uh, with our auditors, making sure that all the information they need is available to them um, and to ensure a, a proper audit with uh, hopefully no major findings or no findings at all. Um, this month, we are looking to um, to prepare at least those adjustments that are required for the first quarter in addition to the second quarter and ensure that I can have that uh, report properly um, uh, properly adjusted for you. And um, this month, the shutoffs will actually happen from the 5th through the 27th for utility customers. I don't really have anything else for you today. Thank you. Whoever's next, come on out. Yeah, I'll wait. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. This is Mr. Parks and Rec Director. Um, I have quite a few updates. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. We're, we're uh, reseating right now Council Park, getting it ready for the adult soccer. Tentatively, it's scheduled for uh, mid December uh, for the uh, veteranos. Um, also, for Joe Munoz, we're getting it ready for the baseball event on Friday. Starting at 8, uh, 6 p.m. this November 8th, we would be glad to uh, have your presence there. Um, considering that we're going to have several special guests coming from out of town, like um, Algodoneros de San Luis de Colorado, Francisco Ochoa, the president of Liga Norte de Sonora uh, has confirmed that he's going to be there, and he's also the owner of Algodoneros. Juan Bustos from Baseball Without Borders, he's a uh, president of the funda uh, foundation that uh, donated baseball equipment to the city. They also shipped out some softball equipment should be coming in pretty soon. And we have a truckload of equipment waiting for us in San Francisco as soon as, soon as we confirm logistics for that. And um, Sueño Dorado Academy, they're gonna take care of the uh, clinics, professional uh, instructors, um, Liga Industrial, from San Luis de Colorado, or sir, come in and participate in an exhibition, a baseball uh, exhibition in the 12U category. They're gonna be facing a team from Summerton and probably reinforced by Sueño Dorado, being led by uh, one of our uh, council members, Jesus Roldan. And um, the ceremony is scheduled for 7.30. The, the invites have already been sent to commission also. Um, just so you know, softball, it's going to start next week, November 13th. We were able to form two categories, 9, nine through 11, we had to combine them, and 12 to 14. Two teams in the lower category and four on the upper. And uh, they're going to play at Joe Munoz. And baseball is going to start tomorrow at 6 p.m. 
here at JCC Field, we have five teams on only one category that was able to uh, get together on the it's seven through nine, ages seven through nine, and flag football. The deadline is this Sunday. We extended the registrations an extra effort to get more teams two weeks, and the final deadline is this um, Sunday the tenth, and. Um, we're set to start for the week of November 18th. And the uh, staff currently is overseeing some logistics for the Corn Fest. Hopefully getting the final details ready. We're making a, a pretty hard effort and assisting everything that is coming. And um, I'm, we're in the best disposition of helping. Let me know tomorrow something and we'll try to get it through. And um, the tower light, this right now to me is a priority. What do you have in front of you? Um, this is something that we came up together and maybe a, a recommendation would be appreciated. We wanna get it through before the, the holidays, but of course it's it's a project that takes some time. The electrical, the, the everything, it's, it's a pretty lengthy process. So any final recommendation would be helpful so we can start ordering because it's gonna be a, a project around $5,000 and we need to know where the money's gonna be allocated from and uh, get, a, get this process going because it's gonna take about two to three weeks at least if we rush it starting tomorrow, hopefully. So just let me know if you have any any input or recommendations. If this is just some options. Yeah. I'll just <laughs> yeah, just let me know in an email. And that's about it. I don't know if you have any questions. You can't recommend it. You can probably say, oh, I really like the. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor and Council, uh, most of you probably saw earlier in the week we had a really uh, dramatic accident on Avenue B and 20th. It was strong enough to knock the motor out of a car. It just sent one person to Phoenix. And that person's still in Phoenix. Uh, so that was a just a sign of the winter season again. I had an interview which uh, came out in the Daily Sun on the front page, and I'll be doing an interview tomorrow with uh, with the news media, the KYM, I believe, or maybe. Uh, the Mexican uh, television news. So we're going to be going over the same thing, being careful on the roads right here. Um, our personnel ran on a, a tragic uh, call. It was uh, the son of a fire captain with rural Metro. And it's always hard on my guys because it's, uh, you go on call after call after call and you feel for the people, but you don't know. But when you know somebody, and you know that uh, the person that you were unable to help is someone that's close to you. Uh, it affects the, the guy, so uh, we, we've talked to them and dealt with them on a, an emotional level. And other than that, we have uh, five new hires, four full-time to fill the four spots that are empty, and one is a part-time slot. And so that hopefully once we get them uh, through orientation and get them their uh, two weeks of training and get them on the floor, then I'll be able to start reducing some of our overtime costs. Good evening, Mayor and uh, Council. Um, just to touch back a little bit of what uh, Chief DeAnda was saying, uh, we responded as well to the needs of the uh, captain from the Yuma Fire Department whose son passed away. And uh, he's right. It's really tough, especially when you know people and, and they're in uniform and you think uh, you still got to have your guard up that they're not going to hurt you, you're not going to hurt them, but it's a crime scene. So um, we're with them. We're very understanding. We, we encourage officers to be very understanding when they have a deceased person on scene to, consider, to place themselves in their shoes for a little bit and to think that even though we still have to protect that scene, we have the opportunity to allow them uh, more, to give them more information, to give them a little bit more access. So know that, uh, that um, we are um, one, one big family. We, take, we try to take care of each other. Um, the other news I have is um, on October 28th, we had the National Prescription Drug Take Back that happened throughout the whole state of Arizona. Summerton Police Department was one of the 60 agencies that participated. Uh, we also have um, the go live date for our data conversion that will be happening here in December. We're looking to push back those dates maybe till March because of some uh, issues that the provider is having. 
Um, so we hope to be going live with the entire Yuma County on, on some data conversion here, probably <coughs> hopefully in March. The other thing I have, and I think most of you have heard, Ms. Maria Hernandez, the 104-year-old female, passed away this week uh, in a small, it wasn't an accident, but she uh, she passed away for uh, because of some heart issues. There'll be some, um, I, I will provide you more information through email on some, uh, they'll be having some viewings for her this week, hopefully. So um, our police department is going to get together and send her some flowers, and we're going to be meeting with the family. To We, we located some family after 20-something years, so... We've been able to locate at least two of her um, husband's uh, granddaughters. So that's some news. Uh, and I, I, I'm sorry that Diane took off, but Diane was, Diane was very uh, critical, Diane Humphries, and our police advocates were very essential in helping us take care of her throughout the years. They were one of the people that were going out there at least once or twice a month to provide her some food. So we're very thankful for that. I'm also very thankful for the uh, Corn Festival committees who was able to get together with us and they're going to be able to provide us some additional security for the Corn Festival. That is a lot of help because of this um, this recent homicide we had and the break-in over here at Chevron and some other cases that we've recently had. Our, our officers have been working a lot of hours, so that's going to be a lot of help and I just want to say thank you for considering that. We also want, I also want to say thanks and, and, and Mayor, if you can reach out to the Mayor of San Luis and thank him for the support that they've given us. Um, they've, we're working closely with the police department chief, Chief Richard Jessup, and uh, they're going to be providing to us at least three to four dispatchers to work with us part-time uh, so we can get our dispatchers trained. The higher ones that we're getting, we're bringing three or four on board. So that's going to be a lot of help because um, our current dispatchers, there's three of them right now, and they've been working for about 11 days in a row. So it takes a little bit of time to put together who we're going to hire in background. So he's um, the city of San Luis has um, been very, very um, good with us in allowing us to, to hire those dispatchers to help us. So we're, we're very thankful for that. That's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, Mayor and Cosi, just a couple of updates. Um, as you know, the firm, the company in the mess area, they're ready to go for the water line extension. They're going to be uh, sending the, their, their part of their, their funding for the water line. As you remember, there was an agreement to have 50% of the construction costs of the line only paid by, by the, that company. So that's coming very soon. Uh, another one is that uh, we, we got an update in application for the facade improvements on Main Street. Uh, I'll be working with the, um, a young couple renovating the building, uh, the blue, like uh, um, on the next to the Chicanos Pula Causa. They're, they're looking into remodel that building and then change the facade. So that will be a proposal coming soon on, from them. Also, uh, tomorrow and Thursday, We'll be uh, showing the, uh, also the city property on the west side. Uh, McDonald's is looking two sides in Somerton. So hopefully we get something done uh, in the next couple of weeks, at least very high interest in that location. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council. We have two major projects, operations ongoing right now. One of them is the 2020 general plan update. For that, we are having a community workshop tomorrow. It's a schedule from 5.30 to 7.30. This is an open house type um, a workshop where everyone is invited to stop by 10, 15 minutes of, of their time. You are also invited um, and review and, and give us the input of what or where do you want to see Somerton in the next 10 years? This is part of the, uh, the, um, the operation, the, the steps in the, in the process to review the existing general plan and uh, trying to gather information to put the update, the new general plan together before we bring it to you for review. So that's, that's part of the steps in the process. The other operation that we have ongoing is the 2020 census count. Uh, this is very important for Somerton and all the um, agencies and, and services that are um, based on, on grant funding. So it's very important for all the residents to um, understand the reason why the, the census needs um, 
to know how many residents are within the city of Somerton. So for that, we have a Somerton count, Complete Count Committee. We have put this together um, as part of an effort to um, educate the residents, to bring the, the word out, to, to convey the proper information to the residents <coughs> as, as the reasons why we need, they need to be counted and not be afraid to be counted. So this uh, Somerton Complete Count Committee operation is led by uh, Vice Mayor Garcia. We have had a training. We had our first training today. It was very um, um, interesting. Um, we had a lot of information. We have another training coming up uh, mid-December, and this is this type of trainings are for all the people, the the staff, the volunteers, and everybody that is going to be assisting the residents when the when the uh, the time comes for them to fill out the questionnaires. We want to have people that are properly trained to assist uh, this this resident. So we have another um, Somerton Complete Count Committee meeting. These are meetings put together on a monthly basis uh, that is scheduled for tomorrow as well. And the Regional Complete Count Committee, which is comprised of all the um, uh, county, Yuma County uh, wide agencies and municipalities. Um, another um, item that I have is that right now we have two open positions with the Planning and Zoning Commission. If you know of any residents that are um, interested in being part of the Planning and Zoning Commission. There are two positions that are open. Uh, this is a, a resident only commission. And we have also two seats that are expiring for the uh, Residential and Commercial Advisory and Appeal Board. As you may recall, we have put together this a year ago and the bylaws states that for the first uh, board, the first term will expire within one year for two members of it. So it's already one year, and two, two of the seats are, are expiring at the end of no November. For this one in particular, we have to have a specific background for the two, uh, two members that, are, um, that we are seeking. One is that they have to have an engineer background, and the other uh, seat is for a general contractor. So if you know somebody with those uh, backgrounds, please have ask them if they want to fill a a letter of interest and submit it to us. That way we can present it to you for appointment. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council. Uh, our street crew continue working on the annual cleanup program. Uh, unfortunately, we are behind about three days. Uh, we are planning to catch up this week or the next week, uh, but we are going to complete the program on time. Uh, currently, the areas 1 to 8 have been completed, basically the north side and the southeast section of the city. Um, uh, we have a contractor on board for continuing with the OptiPave seal, which is basically part of my uh, payment preservation program. We have it on board and our plan is to start sealing uh, in the next two weeks. The areas will be by El Sol Phase 1 and 2, Sunset, North uh, State, and uh, East County. And also an update on the uh, sewer project. Uh, contractor completed the connection with the existing 16-inch force main on uh, the manifold on the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, the pressure test passed uh, last week. And basically tomorrow midnight, we're going to have the final connection with the existing 8-inch force main on Summerton Avenue. With this, the project will be basically complete. Thank you. That's it, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank uh, <coughs> the mayor and uh, Ian for attending the uh, second Summerton Strong Family Proud Pack Ride uh, that we had uh, on the 26th of October. And I also like to thank uh, Attorney Lozano for being part of it as well, participating in the bike ride. And I'd like to have a special thanks for the uh, chief of police uh, helping out in the police department and the fire department. And a very, very, very special thanks to uh, Alfonso and Maribel Zavala for providing the breakfast and helping out with the uh, uh, restaurants as well along the way. And uh, people were very impressed and uh, how was, uh, we had the mayor and the city manager with us there and they're looking forward for the next one. Thank you guys. Vice Mayor. Just a little commercial. This Saturday is uh, the Corn Festival. Everybody's invited. Is at 11, so um, we'd like for those that can't 
at our own time, can be present um, to help us kick it up uh, at 11. Um, thanks to all staff that have been involved with last minute <laughs> things. Um, we appreciate that. Just one question. I think I'm fronted by a couple of uh, residents from up in the Orange Grove area. I guess last year we did clean up up there. Well, they, they, they were asking me how they're going to do it this year. And I said, well, we don't, you guys don't belong to soccer that much. <laughs> but they said, we need the water to soccer. So it was kind of tricky. So I said, oh, let me ask and I'll find out. <laughs> I met with uh, Mark Kelly. He's the uh, he's running for for Senate, and he just wanted to see the, the uh, issues with Summerton and the, the region where so had an uh, Also participated in the mayor's bike run. It was was well well attended. And I wish uh, Councilman Gonzalez would have told me that those shorts that had padding because then the next day I was feeling <laughs> and then I went to Bridget's gift so that it was kind of fitting. <laughs> the, um, then I yeah, participated in the Summerton Fun family bike run. <laughs> Summerton Strong you know, Family Craft. Yeah so uh, thank you uh, Councilman Gonzalez for putting that out. And uh, Ian and I, we met with uh, the new uh, the director of APS, Danny Ortega. He used to be the uh, the mayor of Douglas, so we have that relationship. And, and also the, the Regina, was it Townsend or Towns, Townsy? Uh, she replaced Anna Chalk. So we talked about the various grants that they have and uh, also the, uh, the, the uh, future high school and Possibly the uh, baseball fields and the, the basketball grants that they have for basketball courts, and also the uh, the uh, Centennial Park, the issues that we have, so we can start working on, on, on that and trying to figure out who, who has the, the prior rights. And that. But they, they know, and they're going to start looking at it in their end, too. And um, that's it. So. We're going to take a five-minute break. And yeah. Can I say one more? Uh, just want to go get scared. Sense. You never come to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to say something, uh, and don't get scared. Uh, you, uh, Summerton has a new mayor. Uh, Regina Romero was elected mayor Tucson. of Tucson. Tucson. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she's a Summertonite. So uh, we just came over the oh. internet that she's been elected. Well, to be exactly from Summerton. <laughs> <laughs> Summerton. <laughs> No, they don't pick up trash. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, and I want to give credit to uh, to Paul because he was the one that came out with the Summer to Strong Family Proud uh, name for the, for the back rights. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Make sure you're going to add two more words to it. Easier. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn to executive session? So, so motion by vice mayor and second by.